Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Birch. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics here at UVU. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's session entitled Science and the Public Good. And we are very pleased to have three uh, panelists who teach and work here at UVU uh, who are going to help us think about how science education connects with the broader theme of this week, which is ethics, education, and democracy. So we've been hosting sessions all throughout the week, and we go through tomorrow, where we're exploring different issues in ethics education and the implications of these issues for society as a whole. And obviously, science education fits very well into this discussion uh, and debate. The format of this session is uh, we're going to have each of the panelists uh, present for a few minutes. Each of them is going to bring a, a distinct angle of vision to this broader question. And then once they're done presenting, we will open it up for questions and, and discussion. So please be thinking of quality questions for you to ask as we, uh, as we get to that portion. So to your left is Dr. Daniel Fairbanks, who is a professor of biology here at UVU and the university's research officer. Prior to his position here, Dan served as the dean of the College of Science here at UVU, uh, before which uh, he was the department chair at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And prior to that, he was the dean of undergraduate education at Brigham Young University. So as you can see, Dan comes to us with a lot of experience uh, and expertise. Uh, beyond this, he is an international, internationally recognized and award-winning scholar in evolutionary genetics and related fields. Specifically related to this panel, uh, Dan has done uh, tremendous work in advancing science education both locally and at the national level. And some of you know that Dan is also an award-winning artist whose work uh, has been displayed uh, around the world. So Dan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to Dan's left is Dr. Heath Ogden, who is an associate professor of biology here at UVU. Prior to joining the, the university in 2009, he taught at Idaho State University and was a postdoctoral doctorate researcher at Arizona State University. He is a specialist in molecular and evolutionary biology with a particular expertise in insect studies. Entomology is the field, which I have to practice saying every time in front of the mirror. His research has been published in the journal Systematic Biology, the Journal of Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution, and the Annals of the Entomological Society of America. And some of you know, he is a world-class expert in the mayfly and uh, nerds out frequently in that area. Heath, we're glad to have you here. Uh, like Dan, Heath has been active in science education issues as well, and Heath has been instrumental uh, along with Dan and others uh, in the uh, annual Darwin Day programming here on campus. So if you're interested in learning more about the Darwin Day uh, activities, please see either Dan uh, or Heath. Uh, last but not least, to Heath's left is Dr. Hilary Hungerford, who is an associate professor of geography here at UVU and our faculty senate president, and I must say an, our esteemed and well-respected faculty senate president. Hillary is also an award-winning faculty member here, and her work has been recognized in, in the areas of, schol of teaching scholarship and service here at UVU. She is a specialist in sustainability and more broadly in human environment interactions uh, with specific expertise in Africa. Her work has been featured in the Wiley Blackwell Encyclopedia of Urban and Regional Studies and the Urban Science Journal. Hillary, welcome to you. So as you can see, we have a, a wonderful panel and uh, appreciate taking them taking the time uh, to join us here. 
And without further ado, I will just turn the podium or the microphone over to them, uh, starting with uh, Heath Ogden. Please join me in welcoming this panel. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. And after they were reading everything about Dan, I thought, oh no, how, what are they going to say about me? I haven't done anything. <laughs> but it's great to be here with Dan and Hillary as well. Um, I'm excited to talk about this topic because I love this topic of science education, science and society, and how do we deal with some of these issues. I've uh, put as a subtitle for my remarks a scientific attitude. We're going to talk about what is a scientific attitude and why that's important. You can see in some of the images I have up here, um, the, there's been efforts for a long time to disparage, to decre decrease the trust that, the, that society has in science in a bunch of different areas. And at the same time, scientists have tried to increase trust in science by doing pro-science rallies as well. You may recognize in the top left there, someone right in the middle. No, in the top, well, you, yeah, that's bottom left, but top left, right in the middle. Bill Nye, Bill Nye right? Most of you know that. Um, down below, Mario Capecchi, right, um, from the, the, who received a Nobel Prize from the University of Utah. And then I have off to the right there a quote from one of my favorite science communicators, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And we're going to see if this works. We've got a video here, hopefully. How did America rise up from a backwoods country to be one of the greatest nations the world has ever known? We pioneered industries. It's not showing. Just sound. And all of this required the greatest innovations well. in science and technology. Let me try. Let me try showing it from this way. How did America rise? We might just stop. We might just go forward because it didn't show. I'll summarize what Dr. Tyson said, <laughs> which is easy to do because, you know, Say. it's just Dr. Tyson. All right, so let me it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, basically, he talks about how, you know, we need to be more, we need to have more trust in science. We need to uh, be able to be in a position where we recognize that evidence is what, it, what matters, and that will bring us to these kind of emergent truths that matter. And then we can deal, take those, those er, emergent truths, that objective truth reality, and then we can use that to deal with kind of the other scientific pro or societal problems and societal uh, issues that need to be dealt with. Um, and he ends with this thing where he says, it's in our hands. Like it's, our, it's up to us to be able to do this better. So I've got this slide now that what makes this in our hands is that we have the ability, us as a community, to, ha to be more scientifically literate and to have a better scientific attitude. And that's how we combat misinformation, um, misunderstandings, and all of the other things that cause chaos in, in what I in what about what we know of this world. Um, I really enjoyed reading this author, Lee McIntyre. He's the one that really kind of defined this, this this uh, idea of scientific attitude. And he says that it is an openness to seek new evidence and a willingness to change one mind in light of evidence. So think about those two elements of that, an openness, but then also a willingness to change one mind. And both of those, for a lot of us, are difficult to do because it's almost like it's ingrained in us to belong to the tribe that we belong to and only agree with things that we agree with and any evidence or any things that contradict what we already think, we throw out and we introduce confirmation bias into our lives and we move forward. And a scientific attitude combats confirmation bias because you are willing, you're open to, for new evidence and you're willing to change your mind in light of that evidence if need be. Uh, Michael Mann, who was standing next to Bill Nye in that, in that rally, he said, there's a weakness in the scientific system that can be exploited. The weakness is in the public understanding of science. And it hasn't helped that since the internet and all of the other social media platforms that currently exist, anyone can be their loudest megaphone. And so this has exasperated the, the problem here, because now we've got misunderstanding that's being, that's being um, elevated, that's being amplified, and then the way that some of these 
social media algorithms work, once you start down a rabbit hole, you keep going down that rabbit hole. It, it keeps feeding the beast. And this is a big, big problem. And science, um, a, a good scientific attitude, though, is the solution, I think, or at least one of the solutions to combat this. So real quick, you're going to participate with me. I was going to do like a, an actual like clicker question, but we're not doing that. We're just going to do fingers with me, OK? If you agree with the claim, sugar causes children to become hyperactive, put up a number one. If you don't agree, put up a number two. OK, so now everyone all at once. One and twos all together. Now look around the room. You can see we've got ones and twos. Now put up your hand if you've ever heard, if you've ever th thought that you saw a little kid that ate a bunch of candy or something and then kind of went hyperactive. How many of you think you've seen this before? OK, how many of you have heard, had someone tell you that they've seen that? I think probably almost every hand now in the room probably went up at some point, right? And, and uh, this issue is actually addressable by science. This is a question that we can address. And in fact, there's been more than 12 random controlled studies to address this issue. Some of these have been double-blinded, placebo random controlled studies, which is the, the, like the absolute best kind of study that you can do. In one of these studies, they actually gave all of the children sugar-free beverage, but they lied to half of the parents and told the parents that they were getting sugar dr drinks. And guess what? Those parents rated their children as more hyperactive than the other ones. But it was a lie. It, was, it wasn't true. And in all of those 12 random controlled studies, never once was there a difference between the control and the, and the group. And so it, it doesn't. The sugar does not cause, sugar in like candy and things like that does not cause hyperactivity. Now there's a bunch of other reasons. If you're interested in this, let me know. I've got, I can send you some links and videos if you want to really learn more about this. Um, we don't have time to like delve in with sugar right now. But the point is, are you willing to change your mind? I mean, if you actually went and read all of those 12 studies, or I send you the links and the videos and the arguments, and you read through it, are you willing to have a scientific attitude and to go, all right, I'll change my mind? I had to. I actually thought sugar did cause hyperactivity until I did this. Act I learned about this in, w in one of these education workshops, and now I use it in all my classes because I also thought that it did. But I don't now because I've looked at the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. So use evidence you must, right? <laughs> so a scientific attitude, again, this openness, can, can apply to a bunch of different things. I've just put up on the board some possible topics that we could discuss today if you want to. Any of these things would be like fair game maybe, right? Brian, is that kind of what you're looking for, these kinds of things? Whatever you would like to discuss. And we can, you know, what does science say? Or how can we deal with this? Um, just so you know, I actively am researching all of this. Uh, many of my students that are sitting here today took a survey that this is the results of the survey from the beginning of the semester. This is, this is more than 700 UVU students that are enrolled in the general biology class, the non-majors biology class. Notice 90% accept an old earth, 65% accept climate change, 58% accept human evolution, 40% except the idea that ID creationism, intelligent design creationism, should not be taught in the public high school. 71% uh, said that they'll be vaccinated. 31% think that the genetic variation is higher within racial groups than between racial groups. 37% think that the natural bi biological variations in sex, that in sex includes not only male and female, but also a, a spectrum, this kind of intersex that we sometimes talk about. 45% accept the idea that genetically modified organisms are safe and should play an important role in our food supply. So, you know, we don't all agree, <laughs> and science can say something about this, and so what can we do to kind of reach that emergent truth, that emergent objective reality where we have a much more shared reality, and then move forward, okay? How do we do that? Um, this was a publication that just got accepted this last year with an undergraduate here at UVU. Uh, he, th this student, um, also did a survey on pre and post, so at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester on these Biology 1010 students from a few years back, and you can see kind of in the orange color there, at the beginning on the top, for both general, general evolution and human evolution, there was some acceptance, 
But then after the instruction, so after we go through the semester, much higher acceptance rates of both of those ideas, of evolution in general, but just kind of evolution happens, but then specifically hum human evolution, um, the acceptance went up. So you can change your minds. Like, we can change our minds. We can, we can be, we can have that scientific attitude and be open to change our minds if need be. Here's another example of this. So in this study that was also published a couple years ago with a UVU undergraduate uh, biology student, uh, this student went and interviewed all of our evolution students. So these are like our, right, they're near the end of their degree, they're about ready to graduate. And this student asked them now, they said, think back to before you started college, what would you say? And you can, that's uh, gonna be the two on the, on the left here, um, evolution in general and human evolution. You know, it's only 32% of those students at the beginning of their college degree thought that they maybe agreed with evolution. By the time they get to the beginning of the evolution course, that's now increased up to 84%. And then by the time they get finished with the evolution course, basically all of them agree with this. Human evolution, you can see the pattern similar. Doesn't get quite as high but on, uh, before the evolution class, but by the end of the evolution class, all of them essentially accept human evolution. So. You can change your minds. We can change our minds. <clears throat> this is the most recent study. I've got a student right now working on this. This is a longitudinal study over the last 10 to 12 years. And basically, all I really want to show is that the trend at the beginning of the semester is gradually increasing. So the, the UVU population, year by year, is starting to accept evolution a little bit more, a little bit more. And that reflects the national trend that's also happening that more and more in the nation, evolution is being accepted, okay? So we, we are changing also, and I think that's a pretty good reflection of probably what's happening in the community as well. So I'm gonna end with this slide. When we talk about science and what it can do for the public good, science can answer questions, and it can get at these emergent truths, these scientific consensus that exist. But how do we get there? We only get there through multiple lines of evidence. And when you have multiple lines of evidence that support this idea, this emergent truth, this, this claim, whatever it is that you're trying to, to learn more about, that's the best way that we get there. We never prove anything true in science. We don't truify. We can falsify and get rid of bad ideas. But what we're really trying to do is just knock out the bad ideas, keep the best ideas, and then support those best ideas with multiple lines of evidence. Once we get there, we, we've now we're now at that point where we have an emergent truth a scientific consensus, and then that can be transformed into a shared objective reality, hopefully. This is the hard part, is that science can get to that point, but then the public now needs to buy into that. And we have a problem because much of the public does not trust science. Much of the public thinks that there's this conspiracy or that we're being fed money. I mean, they should go look at our paychecks and know that that's not happening, <laughs> right? But that's, we, we need to help the public get to this shared objective reality. Once we have that, then we can start to address issues in a scientific reality that will make sense, and then we can really start to solve problems. So that's, that's my framework for a good scientific attitude, and that will, that's how I think we can do better in the science education and for the public good. Thank you. I'd like to confirm part of what, uh, uh, what Dr. Ogden presented with, uh, with a personal experience. Uh, I have a son who is very severely autistic. He's now in his 30s. Uh, by the way, the session right before this was on autism and very fascinating. And uh, uh, I remember when he was young, the, there was a lot of discussion about uh, vaccines causing autism and in particular the, uh, a compound called thimerosal that is a mercury-containing preservative that was included in, uh, in childhood vaccines for, uh, to allow multiple uh, uh, multiple doses to be taken from the same vial. And uh, I remember attending a presentation indicating that uh, thimerosal was likely the cause of the vaccine that was then the cause of, of autism. Uh, and the FDA then removed thimerosal from vaccines. And so I thought, here is the confirmation experiment in the public good. And uh, that we should see a decline in the rate of autism with the removal of thimerosal. Well, the rate did not decline. You know, that was back uh, over 20 years ago when it was removed. And uh, I, I looked at the data and I said, I have to accept this as a scientist. 
that, uh, that this compound in vaccines is not the cause of autism. And multiple times the science is, and, and the, I think the, the important thing is, is ensuring that we can uh, teach students to make these sorts of, of uh, logical and evidence-informed conclusions from uh, scientific data. One of the, th I teach uh, Biology 4500, which is the evolution course, the capstone course that Dr. Audrin was referring to a moment ago, and it's a writing enriched course. And one of the, one of the things I, I tell my students is that when you're writing a scientific paper, don't use the word believe, use the word accept, because acceptance is something that is based on the evidence that's in front of us, recognizing that as more evidence may come along, we may need to change our viewpoint. Belief is something that is much different than that, much more personal and not necessarily based on empirical evidence. So the, uh, the topic that, uh, let's see if I can get this to, down there. there we go. The topic that uh, uh, we decided I would address in this, uh, uh, in this panel is science and the culture wars. Well, what is a culture war? A culture war is when you have actually organized groups that have a, uh, a social, political, religious, some reason to promote their particular, a particular viewpoint and obtain some sort of dominance with it in, in some sort of sphere, be it, uh, be it political, educational, you know, whatever sort of a, a situation there is. And uh, there are many cultural wars underway in science, and they're nothing new, as I'll show in just a minute. I've included a few photographs here uh, from the very first protest, public protest, that I ever attended, which was the March for Science on April 22nd of 2017. Uh, you'll see a, a banner there. You can tell that's in downtown Salt Lake by the background about science matters. Uh, you can see uh, in the next slide over a group of, uh, of uh, folks from UVU with their, uh, with their signs and then uh, uh, the, the Utah State Capitol with the group gathering. One thing I will mention is that our group st stuck around afterward to pick up trash in case we needed to. We didn't find a single item of, uh, of trash on the ground. Uh, and you'll also notice with a, a group of scientists the uh, recycling bags that are there in the front. So it was a very different kind of a protest. And then uh, a photo there of me using uh, uh, carbon-free transportation. The, uh, uh, but let me share with you just uh, some examples of cultural wars that I've actually studied and published on in my, in my research. Uh, we often think of uh, evolution going back to Darwin and the major cultural war with Darwin, which of course uh, was there right after the publication of Origin of Species. Uh, uh, the cultural wars over uh, evolution uh, were very heated, especially in, uh, in Great Britain. Darwin himself didn't participate in them, uh, but his defenders did. Uh, but even before Darwin, in Vienna in 1851, when Gregor Mendel, whose uh, work I study, uh, uh, s when he was at the University of Vienna as a Catholic priest, he was studying evolution under Franz Unger, who's uh, illustrated there on the left, who had a very Darwinian type of, uh, of evolution, evolutionary uh, teaching. And in fact, he published, while Mendel was there, a magnificent book. This is one of the images from it. that was intended for the general public to be on tabletop showing uh, hand-tinted lithographs of the various geological periods dating back to tens to hundreds of millions of years ago. And uh, immediately a uh, Catholic priest named Sebastian Brunner, who's depicted there on the right, took on Un Unger in the, in the public press. And in fact, this uh, newspaper that's there on the right that says Wiener Kirchenzeitung is the, uh, the Vienna Church Times. And in it, uh, uh, in it, uh, Brunner viciously attacked uh, Brunner over a period of about five years. 
and it uh, must have put Mendel in an awkward position. And it was shortly after that that Austrian monasteries for, uh, uh, for scientific fallacies. And, uh, and was a very vicious, difficult time because of this culture war. Another one that uh, many people are not aware of is uh, the cultural war that took place in the Soviet Union uh, from the 1930s through the 1960s, uh, involving, the, uh, involving the man on the right, uh, uh, Trofim Lysenko, who uh, uh, the one on the left, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, was a, uh, uh, was a very well-known geneticist and uh, uh, Lysenko claimed that uh, standard genetics dating back to Mendel uh, was completely invalid and was the pseudoscience of the West. And then if you look at the photo on the right, you can see uh, Lysenko uh, speaking with uh, Stalin on the, on the far right and his, uh, his approval of this. This became so vicious that scientists who accepted the uh, evidence of inheritance in the Soviet Union were condemned to prison and death. And in fact, uh, many of them died uh, or were executed. And in fact, Vavilov said famously, uh, just before his imprisonment, we, will, we shall go to the pyre, we shall burn, but we shall not retreat from our convictions. So convinced they were of of uh, following the scientific evidence. And it was not until 1965 that Lysenko fell with the, with the fall of Khrushchev and that Soviet science finally came into, uh, uh, into line with the rest of the world. Closer to home, I'd been involved very much with uh, uh, teaching evolution, particularly teaching evolution in K through 12. Uh, it's actually, compared to what teachers in the public schools have to go through, it's much easier to teach evolution at the college level. Uh, we, as Dr. Ockton showed, uh, students do tend to come around when they're shown evidence. And particularly among our, our biology students, I can confirm from personal experience the data that he gave about uh, biology students. By the time they're done with the capstone course on evolution, we have 100% acceptance of evolution in general as well as human evolution. Uh, but the science teachers who are on the front line in the public schools really face serious challenges with it. And so a group of us got together and produced a presentation that we have been given, giving at uh, uh, the Utah Science Teachers Association and also nationally at the National Science Teachers Association meetings on forming a partnership with universities and the public schools to help in, instruct and work with uh, 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 public school teachers on how to teach evolution effectively in a way that does, uh, that helps students understand what science is and evaluate evidence uh, appropriately. Interestingly, uh, we were in Texas at Texas A&M University in Texarkana giving this presentation and the faculty warned me, you're going to get challenged when you speak. And sure enough, we had a number of uh, members of the community who were there and were very vocal as, uh, as part of this cultural war of uh, over evolution. Uh, <clears throat> I've been heavily involved with uh, uh, cultural war over the myth of race. Uh, scientifically, uh, racial classification is a scientific myth, a social reality. It is a, a, a very real social construct, but scientifically is uh, not supported by the evidence. And uh, uh, this is oftentimes very difficult for some people to accept, particularly uh, in, in light of uh, notions of racial supremacy or racial differences that are presumed to be biological and, uh, and have helped found uh, uh, beliefs in things like white supremacy, which has no scientific basis whatsoever. And uh, this is a, uh, I actually had a, st I was teaching that in a class once and a student said, why don't you write a book about it? And I said, okay. <laughs> and did, and <laughs> that's how this book, Everyone is African, uh, uh, came about. 
And then also, of course, human evolution is, is something that is uh, extremely difficult. And yet, especially in recent times, the evidence that has come out of the Human Genome Project, as well as countless studies in DNA, has shown abundant evidence in DNA of the, the fact of human evolution. And, uh, and the evidence is so overwhelming that it, uh, uh, that it really needs to be shared. And that was the purpose of, the, of this book, Relics of Eden, down here. Well, why might there be reasons, you know, what are some of the reasons for organized opposition to science? Uh, one is that sometimes the evidence challenges deeply held beliefs and traditions. These may or may not be religious. Uh, some, uh, for example, uh, um, the, uh, I know in, in my family it was uh, very difficult to accept the idea of climate change. Some members of my family had uh, uh, difficulty with that. Uh, the, uh, and that leads to the second one, a real or perceived economic threat. Uh, some members of my extended family are em employed in the, uh, uh, in the timber industry and blame uh, the environmental scientists for the demise of, uh, of their economic situation, which is a very real and difficult uh, situation for people so that economic threat, real or perceived, can drive people's uh, rejection of, uh, of scientific uh, evidence. Uh, political and special interests can obviously play uh, a major role in this. The loss of power or influence. Oftentimes uh, groups may base their, uh, their political power or their influence on a particular uh, belief that may not be supported by scientific evidence. And, uh, and perhaps one of the worst is the perceived victimization is that uh, uh, when scientific evidence contradicts something that individuals have may, or individuals belonging to a particular group may have accepted for some time, they then perceive themselves as victims of, uh, of an effort that is uh, uh, focused on uh, destroying something that is dearly held uh, to them. And uh, I think each of us has perhaps to some extent experienced that, and yet, one of the things we must do is recognize, first of all, what scientific evidence is, how we interpret it, and what it means, and then appropriately how to deal with that uh, educationally and with the public in a way that has the greatest effect of, uh, of making sound decisions based on scientific evidence. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, Dr. Hungerford will take over now. Thank you, how y'all doing? Happy Thursday. Um, I'm not gonna take too much time because I'm really excited to hear all your questions, but I'm gonna move us to kind of a, from a theoretical discussion that we've kind of had to more of a concrete example of how science can be for public good and what that means for us in Utah, especially related to climate change. So I'm a professor in the Department of Earth Science I'm a geography professor, but in earth science, we kind of broadly study earth system science. And a lot of what we talk about is climate change um, and other issues too, but that's what I wanna talk to you about today. You might recognize this picture. Who knows what this picture is? Lake Powell, yeah. Lowest water we've seen this summer in Lake Powell and all the um, areas you see of white as white are usually underwater. So this has real impacts in our state, um, recreation, tourism, lots of things. Um, I really liked this slide that my colleague, Dr. Ogden, provided, so I stole it, <laughs> which is not good for scientific practice. I gave you permission. Yeah, but I should cite it. But I really think this is something that we should keep in mind, is that really science and climate change, we think about, okay, what is the evidence? How can we get to a scientific consensus and then how does this inform policy or our shared realities? Okay, so when we're thinking about climate change specifically, uh, the map we're seeing here is from a project called Yale 
um, Yale Climate Opinion Maps, where they survey people across the United States on their beliefs in climate change and how much it's affecting. So this is a map that's showing us estimated percent of adults who believe most scientists think global warming is happening. So they're trying to measure what most people in the US think about, is there a scientific consensus on climate change or not? There is, spoiler alert, there is. Um, this down here is from NASA saying, yeah, actually there's a um, huge consensus on climate change among active climate scientists. 97, even up to 99% of active climate scientists agree that the evidence points to climate change. But then we see that there's this massive gap in terms of what the public thinks. Like the public doesn't think that there is a consensus. So if you're looking at the map, if you don't, don't know how to read maps, you should take some geography classes. They're really fun. But you see that there's hardly anywhere that's at this like 50% and above mark, which is the yellows. Everything below that, the blues and stuff, are less than 50% of the people believe that there is a consensus. So it kind of means like the vast majority of people in the US don't think that there is a scientific consensus on climate change. But then scientists are saying, no, there's this huge consensus on climate change. We know based on all these lines of evidence. And um, this is just on the, what is that, you're right? It's just showing us some of those lines of evidence, saying increased global temperature, um, increased ocean acidification, e increased extreme events and um, storms, increased in frequency and in strength. Um, Arctic sea ice is changing sea level is rising. So all of these lines of evidence, like the, the slide that um, Dr. Ogden provided, all of these lines of evidence are pointing to the same story. And that's a really cool thing about climate science is that you have so many lines of evidence. Um, and I want us to think for a minute that actually climate science and climate change, you can really think about it as a public good because we all need a stable climate to do whatever it is we want to in life. Maybe you don't really care about environmental issues and that's fine, but like maybe you wanna have a family or maybe you like to have a garden or maybe you wanna like exist in a <laughs> state that's predictable and unchanging. Maybe you wanna have a lawn, lots of things and they're all really related um, to environmental goods. Um, and really, yeah, really science education is this gap that's missing between consensus and um, public knowledge. Okay, I wanna just have a few brief slides showing you that like, you know what, science is complex. It doesn't mean that science is harder or better than other disciplines. All disciplines are complex and have their hard parts. So don't, don't hear like, oh, scientists are always the smartest people. That's not what I'm trying to say. But just to show you, especially climate science, it's super complex. There's all these feedback loops. And as things change, like other things change that we didn't anticipate. And I think that's one thing that often we don't really understand when it comes to climate science is, well, we used to hear this and now we hear this. Science is iterative. As we learn things, we push things forward. We have new questions, new lines of thought. And that's, on, that's a hang up, I think, that gets a lot of people in the general public about, well, science keeps changing their minds. No, science is doing what science does, which is pushing forward our lines of thought. Oh, so this diagram is just showing you like everything you have to think about when you think about climate change and how we measure it and the evidence. Um, this is just showing us carbon cycle alone, which is you know one of the major contributors to climate change. So okay, let's look at what that means for Utah. So this was a map that I pulled um, today from the National Drought Monitoring Center. They update the map every week. So this is a few days ago. Areas in Utah that are in drought. So the darkest red is the exceptional drought. The lighter red is extreme drought, severe drought, moderate drought. So you can read from this map that like, yeah, it rained yesterday. That, that doesn't mean anything. It's over a long period of time how we measure 
precipitation and lots of things go into how we measure drought. And I've listed those um, on the bottom. Less snowfall, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, all these different things. Um, so this is a conversation that I have followed pretty closely in Utah. It's something that I study and also I just find really interesting that there's still people who say no, like they don't believe in drought, which is like the evidence is pointing us towards these patterns that are happening. Um, eight of the last 10 years we've been in drought. This is the driest 22 period since 800 CE. And we can measure that through tree rings and other other proxies, because we don't have written records from, from then. And droughts are natural, too. That's the other thing that's tricky with climate change science, is that there's cycles in the Earth. So we have to figure out what's kind of natural, what's being exacerbated by humans. OK, let's look at the Great Salt Lake. This is another example likely you've heard of, being a Utah resident that the summer it's been the lowest level recorded ever, the summer the Great Salt Lake did. So these images, the top one is from 1985, and the other one is for July 2022, this year. And then the graph is just showing us decreasing lake levels over time. This is just the last couple years on the graph. But the image is stark, isn't it? Like, the lake is a lot lower. Like, yeah, who cares? Great Salt Lake's not that pretty. Whenever you fly over it and your plane, it's interesting to look at. But it has real ramifications for the public good. Whether you care about Salt Lake City or not, whether you ski or not, it has real, real ramifications. And is this all climate change? No, it's not. There's a lot of human uses too, human diversions of water. So using all the water upstream not having as much water reach the Great Salt Lake, that plays a part too. But then scientists are, think it's about 50% of it is due to climate change and rising temperatures and having less water in the Great Salt Lake. So this, um, how we might care about this is about 10 to 15% of our snowfall in the Wasatch Mountains is because of Great Salt Lake. So as the air travels over, picks up moisture, dumps it in the mountains right there. Uh, if you ski, that's probably important for you. I don't, but I like to drink water, and I like to have a garden, and those things are really impacted. And am I saying we're going to, like, run out of water? No. Are we going to have to make choices about what, how we use water and what we think it's useful for? Yeah, we're going to have that, and that's coming to us. And I, we've seen some of that this year. This summer, we saw water restrictions across Utah, um, in urban centers and for agriculture. And this just kind of, I think, shows us, like, no offense to my colleagues, but evolution may not have a direct impact on my life. No offense. <laughs> but, like, maybe this does. Maybe this actually has an impact on the way I live. And it just shows, again, the importance of scientific literacy that can be applied in biology and evolution, genetics, and in environmental earth system science. So I'm going to leave us with this because I think it's such a good thing to keep in mind. And then I think we're good for questions. So the three of us are here, and maybe there's a mic that will circulate. So thank you all for your time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Like on a game show, right, I'm uh, emceeing from back here. Just a couple of uh, reminders about the Q&A session. We are live streaming and recording this event. So if you could raise your hand and wait for the microphone to arrive, that would be terrific. Uh, and we ask that you also keep your questions succinct and that they actually are questions for the panel. So with that in mind, who wants to go first? Quick question, whenever I think about science education, it's pretty much uh, a dichotomy between do we fund science education or do we fund art, culture type education? And there's always a direct conflict there. So I was wondering your opinions on one, that conflict, and if it's uh, even still important to keep funding cultural art level types of education, or would we get a better public good if we just threw all that funding into directly into scientific education. I can take that. 
so as a scientist and an artist, I'll go ahead and take that one, uh, which is uh, I don't know that we have to look at it as a dichotomy. Uh, the, uh, there's a, a point of view among some people that we have to look at education purely in practical terms. You know, uh, uh, attracting, and you, you'll see it all over, attracting students into STEM. And of course, being dean, of, when I was dean of the College of Science, I was very active in, in recruiting students there. But uh, the, uh, the so-called non-STEM disciplines, likewise, are, I think, equally important. We don't, we don't really need to create that dichotomy. There is, uh, uh, I think there's a great need for all academic disciplines in education and a need, uh, uh, I think, especially in K through 12 education. Uh, the excluding the arts would be uh, uh, a, a horrific generational mistake if we were to do that in, in favor of the sciences. And so I'm always concerned about this notion of of the sciences and the non-sciences and trying to create a, dic a dichotomy of that uh, when really we should be integrating them. Uh, there's uh, 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 one of the books I would love to write is uh, it has to do with uh, uh, the integration of science and the arts uh, because there is uh, you know tremendous opportunities for that. And uh, so I don't think we have to have that dichotomy. Uh, and in fact, I think we should actively resist it and uh, ensure that, uh, that all areas of education uh, receive support and including uh, education that does not overtly have an immediate practical purpose. You know, life is worth living because of some of the, you know, things like literature and music and art that, uh, uh, that may not necessarily be the uh, putting food on the table or curing cancer, but uh, but nonetheless are you know some of the main reasons that we live. They they give they enrich our lives so greatly and uh, have influenced human culture for uh, f you know f since uh, since the beginning of humans. So um, I've noticed uh, there's a huge gap between people's perception, like of climate change and reality. And um, I'm just wondering how do you propose we bridge that, uh, that gap, given that that perception seems to be along political lines and those culture wars are stirred up by politicians and people who have a vested interest in right, keeping your voices out of the public forum. Um, everyone should take our classes at UVU. <laughs> and I should do some of these pre-post um, assessments like Keith has done. Because I find that in my own classes too, that when students come in, they're, you know, there's a lot of chatter around that culture war stuff around climate change or vaccines or evolution. But then as we go through class and, you know, we talk about it as um, look at the evidence and really like have a scientific mind and be, op be open to it. I think that is the key, right? Like how, how can we talk about it in a non-threatening way? That's not gonna make, make it mean that you're a different political party. You can still, if you can have your identity and you can still accept climate change or other scientific evidence, yeah. Yeah, my, st I mean, here at UVU, our strategy is in the classrooms we can do this um, so I'll first speak to that. You, we, we need to be better at helping people understand the nature of science first. So that's why I like my sugar example. Turns out as many liberals and, and conservatives get that wrong, right? And, and GMOs, for example, is one where liberals get it way more wrong than conservatives do. And so it, finding, finding um, examples that can teach the nature of science that are not tied to perhaps a, a political party or religious group or something like that first and let students practice that is what I do in my classroom. And then once they've got enough practice on how to do that, then I can be like, all right, now let's look at evolution. All right, now let's look at you know, climate change or vaccines or whatever else the issue is that we need to look at. And it works, like I, I have the data that shows that you can change, now you don't get absolute agreement, but you can change people's minds. 
So how do we do it at a broader scale? Um, events like this, hopefully the general public is watching, right? But in, in the high schools, as Dan said, it's easier to teach some things in the university. I mean, in some high schools, they have books banned, right? That you can't even read. And so, and in some areas of the country, they're banned from doing other things in high schools. And so we have to be careful of that here in Utah in particular, that we don't let um, those kinds of issues be driven by people who perhaps are not as informed about these kinds of things, and that we have good um, people making arguments when they're deciding on who's going to run the school boards and who's going to make policies about what's being taught in the, in the K through 12 classroom. And Utah's been pretty good about that relative to other states, um, but we can do better. Yeah, and if I could mention one thing, the word uh, threatening came up a moment ago, and I think one of the keys is teaching in a non-threatening way. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, as uh, Heath mentioned, we need to start with the nature of science and saying, look, we're not trying to threaten someone's belief or, or even play a side in a cult cultural war. In fact, I kind of uh, don't like the term cultural war because it, 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 it really is a, a question of seeking truth and, uh, and seeking what's there and showing that that there is no uh, particular uh, threatening agenda that scientists have, uh, but rather the, the motivating factor is discovering what truth is and having that truth be evidence-based in uh, using methodology that uh, helps to lead us there in the most confident way possible. So I think that idea of, uh, of being non-threatening and respecting the fact that people have diversity of opinions and beliefs is, is really important, particularly in the educational sphere. So um, I'm currently working on a research project about why society is so avoidant of GMOs. I've always supported them, but I was really curious as to what the counterpoints were. And one of the ones that I found really interesting was the worry that because only larger corporations will have access to GMO crops, that small farmers will be facing business failure. And I was just wondering what your guys' thoughts were on that and if you thought that that could be a potential problem or what? I'm not a specialist in this at all. Um, that's, why I took over. I, that's why I was. Go, that's why I looked at Dan because he's a he's a plant geneticist, so he knows more about this kind of stuff. But let me just let me just say, um, I, the, one of the things I, I always emphasize with my students is DNA is DNA, right? And so even when you've, I mean, because I always say, well, who who doesn't want to eat genetically modified organism? organisms you know a bunch of the students will raise their hand I'm like you guys need to stop eating then because everything is modified because everything evolves like everything changes now whether we're we're actively doing kind of manipulation in some way right is a little bit different but still I just point out that everything's DNA and everything evolves everything changes so this idea that things aren't modified is erroneous everything is modified but I'll let Dan answer the more specific part yeah, and uh, a lot of people, I think part of it too is, uh, is ensuring that people understand the science behind it because uh, uh, what we typically refer to scientifically as a genetically modified organism is one that has had uh, DNA brought in from another organism and transferred in in a, in a non-natural way. You know, if you think of plants and animals have been, uh, people have been breeding those for millennia and uh, that's how we ended up with our domesticated uh, species that we use for food. And so uh, genetically modified organisms is, have been around since prehistory. Uh, but the idea of taking, uh, say, a bacterial gene and putting it into corn so that that uh, corn can resist the uh, herbicide Roundup, you know, glyphosate, is, uh, is one of the major er uh, areas of uh, genetically modified organisms. And so I think what we have to do is say, well, what does science tell us about it? And the fact of the matter is, is that the genes that are transferred end up producing proteins that have, you know, are very much like the, the, the proteins that we, would, uh, uh, that we would normally eat and that there is no evidence whatsoever that, the, that these genetically modified organisms cause human harm. 
the and in fact for me the the real tragedy in this is the fact that the health concerns over genetically modified uh, when a company that will remain nameless uh, sued a farmer because pollen drifted over from an adjacent field the farmer then saved the sea seeds from his field and planted them and then was sued for planting the patented uh, genetic material that came from uh, uh, from this other company simply because of natural pollen drift. And uh, that to me is a far greater concern than the health concerns that have absolutely no evidence. And in fact, yeah, we, we can say there's no evidence to support it, but there is in fact evidence that is contrary to claims that it causes uh, uh, health problems. And uh, because the United States has not uh, mandated uh, uh, GMO food labeling, uh, probably all of us in this room routinely eat GMO foods. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, uh, it is very, you know, it is very common. There is, uh, there is no evidence to indicate a health problem there. But again, we need to look at the, at the scientific evidence on that. And, and again, think of what, how it can distract from more important things too. Yeah, I have one brief comment to add. I think your question is really good and showing you that science isn't gonna answer everything. Like an issue of one company monopolizing seeds and farmers can't, that's not a science question. That, so science isn't gonna answer everything. Like we can talk about what are, like, what are the benefits or what are the risks of GMO? But in terms of like social justice or economic science isn't gonna answer those questions. Those are other fields. That's why we need, uh, that's why the university is what it is, right? We need varied people who study lots of different things. So w they can come in and say, yeah, okay, we know this other issue exists and like the science is showing us this, but how do we get here? So yeah, that was a really great question. Yeah, and if I can briefly add to that, uh, uh, the, the whole idea of racial classification scientifically does not have a, a, a good scientific basis, but is a very real sociological and legal concept. And we have to recognize that it is real, and it's something that uh, 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 science may not have the, uh, all of the answers for that yep. aspect of it. I just have one comment and then a question. One comment that you young people, this earth is yours to to take care of. As old people, we're, we're not going to be here that long. But what you can do is vote. Find out people who believe in science and ask them questions and find out what their platforms are on scientific principles. And then cast your vote for people that will support scientific principles. That's something that you can do in the midterms coming up. So anyway, that's one, one little soapbox. And one, one question for the panelists. A real conversation I had uh, recently was with someone about climate change and the man said, God controls the weather. I don't believe in climate change. I don't believe in global warming because God controls the weather. How do you even begin to have a conversation with someone that will not even think about scientific principles? So I have the solution. No, I don't <laughs> have the solution. Um, you know, I think it's important to meet people where they are, to recognize that that's, that's a worldview, and scientists aren't trying to make you not believe in God. That's not what, we're not trying to do that. There's different questions that that answers, a, a faith worldview. That answers different questions than science does, you know? And they're both important. And I don't think any of us are like trying to convince any of our students in a particular believe like in a particular way. But yeah, it is hard, right? There's walls and I mean, maybe starting slow, like he'd said, let's start with these kind of non-threatening things. Like, oh, let's look at how tornadoes form or something. Like, let's start small thinking about weather and how it changes and just how complicated it is and maybe yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. Have a coffee and talk and each understand each other and maybe not focus on changing minds. Just like, okay, I accept that that's 
that's a valid way that you think that and that's great and I'm happy for you <laughs> and your thoughts but I'm going to do something else um, I don't do climate change but I, that same question is essentially you know God created humans or whatever right and it's kind of the same question here um, some of the research that we did at UVU has shown that I liked how she said you got to meet them where they're at um, it finding role models scientists who do believe can sometimes help bridge that that gap sometimes sometimes the person is just not going to listen and you try to help and try to help and go you know you'd be as non-threatening all of these things we've been saying but uh, sometimes it does help if you can just say look there's all of these people who believe just like you believe but they also accept the science right so I think that it's okay if someone is like, I want to believe in God, okay, great, but you need to accept the science. And so if there's a conflict, then we, then let's discuss, okay, why is there a conflict there in, in that worldview? Um, and conflict exists. Conflict exists in science. Like, like it, that's not something that doesn't exist. So we need to be okay with a little bit of uncertainty and then kind of move forward through those difficult conversations. But... I think that it's a mistake to be, you know, to talk down to them and, and things like that. But I, I found, the research sh has shown that here at UVU, the biggest factor in that Bio 1010 class for students changing their minds is that they know that there uh, are scientists who believe in God and also accept s revolution. And that one thing lets many students kind of just get over that hump. Oh, well, I don't have to then throw out everything that I believe. I can accept this and I can reaccommodate my belief system a little bit. Here, I'll get you. Um, just expanding on your question, I feel like most people have like their ideas on climate change, but they really just they don't believe that the impact that we have is like at a great enough scale. So at the same time, you can they can say that you know God creates the weather or whatever they want but uh, at the same time what can we do to on like what scale can we help climate change yeah that's such a good point too because and that's what's tricky about climate science earth system science because things change things do change like there has been periods of warming in the past there has been periods of cooling that's th w evidence points us there evidence shows us that but then we have to say, okay, we know the same evidence is showing us that there's been a drastic fast rise in temperature over the last 150 years. And evidence is showing us that too. So if we're gonna accept some evidence and we're gonna have this evidence-based mind, then we also accept this evidence. And I don't think we need to put it on a personal thing like, you know, you're bad because you, my husband commutes to Salt Lake City. That's kind of a bad thing for like an environmentally person to do, <laughs> right? But it's not going to be like one. We should all, of course, like think about our actions and change what we can, do what we can, what we think is right, but also realize that there's these broader structures like our energy systems and our infrastructure, that that's where really where a lot of change is going to happen. So like don't feel too bad if you like if you have a truck that gets terrible gas mileage. It's okay. It's okay. I do things that are probably aren't really that environmentally friendly. I shop on Amazon, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> probably things that it, maybe if I was really trying to be critical of my own carbon footprint every second, that I wouldn't do. But I know th also that it can't just be blamed on individuals, but we have to look at these broader structures. I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, so don't feel bad, but also think and be coherent and reflective. <coughs> um, so my question hopefully isn't a little bit too much of a devil's advocate type question, but um, so my question was um, how, do, how does science and I guess scientists in general keep an open mind, like having a scientific attitude in the current culture war environment and are there any scientific consensuses um, that have a difficulty being challenged by new and potentially controversial evidence uh, about any 
any, about any subject, um, if those new consensuses might be dangerous or bad for society, like how does science handle those realities and do they happen very often and what, I don't know, what does that look like? Scientists, sh not, uh, not just scientists, all of us should have a good scientific attitude, okay? But scientists should be especially good at this. This is what we should be, that should be a core con concept, a core kind of principle that we live by. And if we're wrong, we're wrong and we need to change our minds. Um, I really thought that the COVID, <laughs> I, COVID wasn't a good thing, but the COVID experience was an interesting experience because what it showed is it showed kind of upfront for the general public what does science go through? Because we kept getting, you know, it's like our best evidence was saying, you don't need to wear a mask. And all of a sudden, you need to wear a mask. And then this and that. And it, and it was changing. And as Hillary said, science does change. And we move where the evidence takes us. That change is not a bug. It's a feature. And we, we, should, we should recognize that. We should celebrate it. And, and we should move forward where the evidence takes us. But we need to be humble enough. To, to change our minds if need be. So I actually thought COVID was a really, it was an opportunity for the world to see what science really goes through. And instead, we, uh, we got a decrease in, in kind of trust in science, right? They're like, oh, they're always changing their minds. And it's like, no, 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 you always get the after, like they get the textbook version of the co scientific consensus. N and then this one time when they had the opportunity to actually watch science happen in real time, it was like, you didn't take advantage of this opportunity to actually watch what science happens. So I think that uh, we need, I agree, we need to be better at, at moving, and there's lots of examples in my field of where things have changed. I mean, even in my own specialty, um, where if it changes and the evidence points you in a different direction, you must move where the evidence takes you. Yeah, I was thinking about the COVID example too. Like at first, you know, people were like wiping down groceries and stuff or thinking, am I risking my life? going to Trader Joe's for some pumpkin ice cream. Like that was the real thoughts that people had. And I had those too. And I, I guess, so after time when uh, you learn more, the evidence points to other things like, okay, yeah, I can safely walk around with masks or I can be vaccinated and my risk is going to be very low. Yeah, I think the COVID example gave us a lot and also like I was reflective of my own kind of thought process during that as a good scientist mm -hmm. saying like okay like things are changing fast how am I making sense of this new evidence and then how is that affecting the way that we go about our lives and I'm not a health scientist so you have to rely I had to rely on experts and colleagues here yeah so it, it was messy and good Um, I got another question. It's very different, but it is how wide or at least how much of the population is in the intersex group, which is neither male nor female, because you had that as one of the pieces. He's asking the percentage of the population that's in intersex, like what, what's the current yeah. thinking on that? and also yeah. what kind of that looks like. Yeah, I think uh, uh, regarding intersex, we need to look at their, uh, it's an extremely complex issue because there really is a, uh, uh, there really is a continuum with, you know, with two very distinct nodes in it. And uh, that's biological. And uh, there are cases of, uh, uh, and in fact, the term intersex is not used scientifically as much anymore, uh, but there are biological reasons for uh, variations from the, the strict female and male uh, that I could go into, but I'd need several hours to go through it <laughs> with you because it is, it is genetically and biologically very complex. Uh, but, uh, and so it's not possible to come up with a, a strict percentage term because of the continuum. It, you know, we have this tendency, uh, this is one of the problems we have uh, uh, sometimes in communicating science is that we humans have a tendency, I think, to want to categorize into discrete categories when in reality we may be actually looking at something that is a, is a continuum. 
and uh, that's, that's the case here, uh, that we're looking at two nodes with a continuum in between and many reasons for that continuum in between. So it's not possible to really come up with a, uh, a percentage value to, uh, to say, you know, how many humans are intersex. And in fact, it's in, in some ways too, it's very much like racial classification that uh, some of it may be uh, self-classification and self-recognition uh, because there's the, uh, there's the uh, scientific idea of, of uh, sex assignment and then uh, gender, which is, uh, uh, has social aspects and personal aspects with it as well that, uh, that may not have as a definitive a biological component to them. And so I think we have to recognize that. So yeah, I can't give a, a specific percentage value, but recognize that what science does tell us is that, uh, that uh, <coughs> people are not, you know, looking at the population overall, not strictly female or male. That uh, there, there is a continuum in between that. And that is uh, scientific and biological. And there are uh, uh, some very good genetic reasons to uh, explain that. Thank you, Dan. I just want to ask a question uh, about uh, the current culture wars as they play themselves out in school boards and as they're playing themselves out now re regarding the teaching of evolution in K through 12 and the relationship to creationism and intelligent design. And if you could articulate the principles that distinguish uh, the, the devotional study of creation versus the scientific study of evolution. Well, this has a uh, history here in the United States. Uh, there were multiple Supreme Court cases, like in 1987, Edwards v. Aguilard, that basically said you can't, it's against the law to teach um, a particular religious viewpoint and advocate for that if it's going against, you know, the science, basically. So it'd be taught as science. Yeah, yeah. And so you can't teach it in the sci high school science public classroom. You can teach it if you want to in like a humanities course or something like perfectly fine to do like world religions or world creation stories or whatever. That would be completely fine. It's just in the science class, you can't advocate it there. Uh, and that's been carried through. And then intelligent design came along many years later. And there was a court case in Dover, Pennsylvania that basically showed that intelligent design is just creationism rebranded. Um, and it was ruled that you can't teach that because it's essentially just creationism. And so you can't teach it in a high school public funded classroom you, because um, public institutions must be religiously neutral when it comes to those kinds of things. So we keep it out of the science, but you know, if you're a teacher, I always tell like the high school teachers that have talked to me about this, I always tell them, I say, it's okay to address this issue. You just may need to make sure that you're not advocating that particular religious viewpoint because you can't do that. So you can't advocate that particular religious viewpoint. Thank you, that was helpful. Just as a side note, the recent Supreme Court decision on the Carson v. Macon case regarding the uh, public funding of devotional education could have implications for yeah. how this, this I know. division plays itself out. So if you're interested, right, uh, students in, in learning more about this, uh, yeah, explore the, uh, the Carson v. Macon case. We hosted a session on that mm. uh, yesterday, and it was really interesting and fascinating. Okay, we're going to have one more quick question. I see a hand here. Uh, so science education is a ongoing project and it is not a rapid process. The biggest change that I could think of would be uh, over a couple of decades, like through changes in K through 12 education and then uh, like regarding younger generations moving up. So are there realistic ways to affect change 
in the public perception of s science outside of a formal educational uh, spectrum? Kind of as, I, I mean, I talked bad about social media platforms, <laughs> but they also can be used for good. I mean, there's some great science channels out there, you know, um, the, the Green Brothers, and, and there's a bunch of really great stuff. So if you find the good channels, right, the, and those podcasts and other things that are out there, you can, you can learn anything. And there's free MOOC, cor there's these courses all over. MIT has a ton of free courses. So if you want to learn anything right now, you can learn anything that you want to. So I would say take advantage of that. The danger is that sometimes you click on something and then you start down this rabbit hole and all of a sudden you think the earth is flat, right? Because you've accepted a few positions from a couple YouTubers. So you have to be careful of that. But I definitely think that um, you know social media can be used for good, right? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, there's lots of folks on TikTok who talk about <laughs> climate change. And yes, I waste time on TikTok also. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a lot of power in social media. But it's tricky because a lot of people don't have that baseline understanding, right? So that's why you kind of need, I think they complement each other, like K-12 or um, college education. But then communicating in fun ways to get more people to find it broadly cool. Sadly, we're out of time. Dan, did you have something to say? Okay. Uh, before uh, we publicly thank our, our panelists, I just want to uh, draw your attention to the web page that hosts the schedule. If you're interested in knowing more about these kinds of issues, we've posted some readings and some video links, and we're willing to post more. As, as these come up. So if, if you want to check in on that and learn more, please, we encourage you to go and uh, we want to give you as much or more information than you can consume here. So please join me in thanking our panelists.